Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Today is April 25th, 2022, and this is the first meeting of 2022 of the City of Topeka's Public Health and Safety Committee. I am last year's chair, so I will help kick off this meeting. We have two brief points of order to start the meeting, and that is to welcome our new fourth member as well as to elect a chair. The, um, the target and focus of this meeting is to talk about some draft amendments to the city's uh, version of the property maintenance code regarding vegetation. Then we will simply touch on some updates of other things that are going on in the Change Our Culture uh, initiative that this committee has undertaken and hopefully set meeting dates um, through the summer. With that, um, we'll call this meeting to order and introduce um, our carryover. We're missing one person, Neil Dobler, Councilman Dobler from District 7 today, but Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala and our new committee member, Councilman Duncan, Deputy Mayor from District 8, are on board. So if you would self-introduce. Christina Valdivia Alcala, District 2. Spencer Duncan, District 8. Glad to be here. Thank you so much and welcome to the committee. We're gonna jump right in. With that, we do need to elect a chair for 2022. Not it. What was that? Move. Not it. <laughs> Move to nominate Karen Hiller as chair. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, I am willing to do that. If it's the pleasure of the committee, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. Thank you. And we will jump right into our changing the culture of property maintenance discussion. And to, to kick that off, I will hand the baton to Amanda Stanley, our city attorney. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I was asked, um, our office was asked to draft some changes to the vegetation ordinance, and this came out of the changing the culture of property uh, maintenance, listening sessions that you guys did last year and concerns and questions about vegetation. So in your packet um, is the modified ordinance and I'm just gonna walk you through it and then if you have any questions, um, I'm here to answer those. Also Mary Feeney who helped draft it in conjunction with Mike Hagen from Property Maintenance and Travis from Forestry um, also is here to answer any questions if you have them. And I think we also had some pretty strong input from people about nat natural Gardening? Yes. I don't, is anybody on? I don't see the names. It looks like Kevin is. Yeah, right there. Oh, Kevin Seek is on, and, and Russ Klump from the police department helped with that, too. Thank you. Okay. So the primary changes that you're going to see to this ordinance are on page one in your attached packet, and they start on line 17. And the key change is that it changes the definition of weeds to the more broader definition um, for vegetation. In addition, in line 18, it changes the language from premises and exterior property to property, including easements or public right of way abutting the property. So this is a broader definition, makes it more clear so that everybody knows what property we're talking about. Uh, vegetation is defined as vegetation excess of 12 inches in height, all noxious weeds as defined by Kansas statute, uh, which the Department of Agriculture rules and regs update those on an annual basis as needed, shall be prohibited. Vegetation means, but is not limited to, weeds, woody vines, volunteer trees, brush, grass, and uncultivated plants. However, the definition goes on to exclude uh, natural gardens, uh, which are defined as areas cultivated for growth of vegetables, fruit, herbs, flowers, or other plants that provide food for consumption or the attraction and aid of wildlife. And that was in response to concern about natural gardens and not wanting those to be lumped into vegetation. If you move on to page two on line 30, one uh, that just removes the word weeds and replaces it with vegetation. And then in line 33, uh, it creates a new section for owners of undeveloped property that exceeds one acre to make it clear that they are only responsible for removing or destroying vegetation within 30 feet of the property line. The rest of the ordinance as you go through is clean up uh, through the various violation sections to change like, for example, on page four, the weeds and grass has changed the word vegetation to make it consistent with the new definition <coughs> section. And those kind of changes of removing weeds and replacing it with vegetation is carried throughout the remainder of the ordinance. 
And I'm happy to stand for any questions. Also, like I said, Mike and Travis helped from a practical standpoint defining what weeds and look like, and I'm sure they're happy to answer any questions. Well, and I see that Mary Feeney's online as well, and I know she did a lot of the, of the prep work. So thank you, Mary, and I'm glad you're here as well. Um, questions from the committee. We really do need to discuss this through just to make sure it's clear um, this is being considered up front right now as the, the, the first item to come back to this committee for discussion because the issue of knocking back vegetation and, and, get, and getting the action part of, our, of these, uh, this set of initiatives going, um, the thought is that we would discuss this and hopefully arrive at consensus even today on what this is going to look like, but not necessarily pass it until this growing season has, till we've experienced this coming growing season. Is that right? Or are you thinking if we have consensus, we should go ahead and take it to council? My understanding is that you want to allow the growing season as an educational purpose. We can do that in two ways. If you want to go ahead and move this through to council, agendas are light right now coming into budget season. We can always do a delayed implementation date. So it says effective whatever date we want it to be, but then it does not have to wait for council. We'll just do a delayed effective date if you prefer to push it on to council now. Okay, so let's see how we're feeling about it today, but um, thank you for doing all this vetting outside this uh, venue, and then we'll see what we've got. And can I make one more note about- Please. In your packet, you also have the forestry provisions. Um, we included those because the forestry provision might need additional changes after you decide on vegetation. Um, but once you decide on this ordinance, we can make appropriate changes to the forestry ordinances as well. But that's why they're included with the ordinance in your packet. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I've got a couple questions, but I will certainly defer uh, if, if others have brought some forward. Councilman Valdivia Alcala. Hey. Um, I really like the majority of the wording, and I think that this is going to give the um, expanded, you know, wiggle room for what I believe is going to be seeing more and more folks coming on for a type of native grasses, native flowers, uh, et cetera, to attract pollinators. You're not, I think that you're going to see more and more moves in some areas, some neighborhoods away from this traditional lawn, you know, with killing, you know, just the nice green lawn, et cetera. But I just want to make sure that when it says vegetation means, but is not limited to, no, not that, sorry. Gardens, which are defined as areas cultivated for growth of vegetables, fruits, herbs, flowers, or other plants that provide food for consumption or the attraction and aid of wildlife. Um, and again, I think that that sounds really broad and I think that's a good thing. I just want to make sure that even if we're going to wait for this current growing season, that we have a, a handle on um, how that is going to be taken in by those that are going out and looking for possible write-ups or there being a complaint that comes for a yard that is perceived as overgrown, but it actually has, you know, maybe a, a, a garden in the front yard um if there is going to be some type of education to this and more in depth that they can refer back to if if they have to really get in and start looking hard at um at what may or may not be in some of these front yards or in backyards if that was if if it even got to that point and i'm not saying that it even will i i'm just asking I might defer this one to Mike Haugen from Property Maintenance. He's here. We've had this address this kind of issue under the current code, really. So, yeah, sure. So, these issues don't come up frequently. Over the last seven years, three times, usually the property owner contacts us and says, "This is my intent. This is what I'm doing." We go out and look. They explain it to us, and we leave it at that. We have one in particular where she created what we would she termed an English garden. <laughs> It's not well maintained. So we have to go back and forth with her to pull out the weeds that are growing within her garden. 
Um, we don't just go clear cut the garden. Our most recent one that we had this year, there was just a lack of communication between us and not the property owner, but the person taking care of the property. So they, the person that is maintaining a natural garden doesn't own the property. We were communicating with the owner of the property. Therein lied the confusion because the owner wasn't articulating what we were saying to a point where we learned how to communicate with the, the person living there. Once we made contact with that person, I went out there, I visited with them, hung out with them. They talked about all the cool plants. <laughs> um, and uh, we were good with it as long as they, they maintained certain little areas, which they did. When we first sighted it, there was some overgrowth of grasses. They had cut those just because it was time to cut them, not because of us. And when I was out there, it was acceptable. So it's, it's, it doesn't happen frequently. And of the thousands and thousands of properties that we've sighted, I'm putting it on one hand. And so the issue is that those are okay now. So the, we're, we're more of the, the language got changed to clarify, if, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, city attorney, to, to clarify as we're talking about addressing other vegetation that has grown over 12 inches, including trees and shrubs, things that were not being written up before, there was a need to clarify that they went ahead and put language in to clarify that these natural gardens were okay, but, but you guys have okayed them in the past it, anyway. And it, it simplifies it because I was the one, ma I'm making that determination without it being in code. Mm -hmm. I have eight inspectors out there citing the properties who are interpreting the code. If one of them interpreted differently and clear cut this property, we would have had a problem. Even though it fit our code and we could probably do it, it's not the right thing to do. So the right thing to do is get it clarified so that both the resident and the code inspector understand what we're doing. And so the net, I mean, boots on the ground is that with that interpretation of the code that we have, if we don't pass this within the next 30 days or something, a garden like that that, is, that appears to be being cultivated, not just ignored, will be okay. Correct. It, it has been sit, since before I was here. Yeah. Okay. But good question because we want to, we have people watching as well and we want to clarify what, what, what the language was, what it's going to be and what our intent is with it so that we all are on the same page. So other questions? Councilman, I mean, Deputy Mayor. Either way. Um, <laughs> I guess this might be directed to Mike. Do we have a noxious weed expert on staff or do we just lean on our county weed director? What, what is the process of when we show up to these sites and say, I don't know what's a noxious weed and who's our in-house expert on that? So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we just <laughs> happened to go to a noxious weed training and every one of my inspectors and I went. Um, it's nice to know there's only four in Shawnee County that are prevalent out of all the noxious weeds that we, we can deal with. We, noxious weeds don't usually come up. It's usually tall grass or the weeds reach 12 inches. Um, but if we become of, aware of it, if we go, look, this whole lot's filled with noxious weeds, we would get it sighted. It hasn't been the standard or the norm for us. We usually just nail it at 12 inches and, and cut it down. Gotcha. Um, okay. Maybe between city attorney Stanley and, and Kevin Seek that's on board though, there are apparently a, a couple, there, the people who are really into this are familiar with noxious weeds a little more than we were. And also there are a few that people have in mind ought to be added to the noxious weeds list. Can you, can you say what our source is for noxious weeds? Because we don't declare them ourselves as a city, right? No, no, Kevin was the one that taught the class. He did an excellent job. <laughs> He's the one that shared what the noxious weeds. He showed us the pictures of them, gave us the, the names of them, provided us a, a binder filled with them where everything's inside a protective case so when we do get there and we see a weed that could look like it we can tell the difference between it being noxious and not considered noxious um well if it comes to how what weeds are going to be considered that's going to be way beyond our purview and that would go over to the shawnee counties so noxious come. weeds come out of statute ksa 2-1313a and i pulled it up um this 
gets negotiated every couple years between the state legislature and counties who care a lot about noxious weeds. Um, but they're defined under rule and reg authority, so um, they're published by the Department of Agriculture. They take a look every few years, if not every other year, to see if there are new species that need to be added to the list in Kansas. And, and there are trainings, like Mike said, as well as I know the counties are always happy to assist with their expertise as needed. Okay. I would. I, I can't remember which plants unless it's honeysuckle. <laughs> the I don't will... have them in front of me. Kevin's <laughs> online. He could probably exactly. tell you which ones they are. Well, the bush honeysuckle that you're talking about, am I? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, the bush honeysuckle that you're talking about, Karen, is what's considered to be an invasive species. So it's a non-native plant that causes harm in some way, uh, economic or to damage to the environment or human health, but they're not, they're separate from noxious weeds because they're not cited specifically in some governmental statute with specific rules about their control. And so um, in this change to the ordinance, there's nothing in there about invasive plants, and that's a, a whole separate issue from noxious weeds. So I think it's really good that we've defined what noxious weeds are so we can pin that down. If it becomes an issue, we can say, it's a noxious weed, you know, don't take it from us, it's in Kansas statute. And it's also a thing where um, no, the noxious weed department can help with the enforcement and mitigation of those weeds. Invasive plants, in my response to the email that I got, I, I included some resources in there that might help educate y'all on the problem with those plants. And that's something that is going to be a whole nother can of worms because um, like the bush honeysuckle that you've mentioned is a big problem um, in our community, but we don't really have a program for uh, how to control and, or replace that. Many of these invasive plants began as, were introduced as ornamentals because they thought they were good plants, then they found out there was a problem with them. And so they're gonna be plants that a lot of of private property owners have on their property. So, you know, the, I think the place to begin addressing those kind of plants is going to be education. And that's something that I've been in conversation with Russ about getting information up on the county website to begin educating the public about these issues because eventually the city and county's gonna to wanna to do some to address them, but it's gonna, you know, it's not something we can do just with the stroke of a pen overnight. It's gonna take some thoughtful uh, consideration of how to approach it, and it's gonna be uh, a long-term investment of, of time and resources to address the problem. Okay, thank you for that, because we, we knew you had raised a lot of issues there. So just on a side note, something we've been figuring out is that even though the county and the city have really fabulous websites, we probably need to go farther than that to do public education. But uh, right. the talk shows are very really open to those kinds of things. Councilman Duncan. Yeah, I'll just uh, real quickly, I won't repeat what Kevin said, and that, that, I support this. I think this is a good change. One of the things I like about it is that it uh, puts us right in line with the state's definitions of nox noxious weeds. Uh, one of my day jobs is I'm the executive director of the Kansas Pest Control Association, and we actually also have members who are lawn and landscape folks, and so I get to sit through these thoroughly exciting noxious weed conversations that the state has every few years and listen to them <laughs> debate what should and shouldn't be included. And, and they, they do a pretty good thorough job of listening to people from across the state. And, and to Kevin's point with the invasive weed, this gives our people a very clear definition of what it shouldn't be around and what needs to be eliminated by code. And then there's a the difference of the invasive ones we don't like, but I know there are some things people 
some people like their invasive plants and they want to maintain them. And so I don't want us going in and, and I know we don't, but you know, create a situation where we're citing them, if they're maintaining them, keeping them on their own property and love their, love their honeysuckle. So, or whatever it may be. So I'm good with this change and I would, I would definitely support it moving, moving it forward. Great. Um, let me introduce another element on this. In the string on lines 23 and 24 where we define vegetation, it says vegetation means but is not limited to weeds, woody vines, volunteer trees, brush, grass, and uncultivated plants. Is shrubs a big enough, it seemed to me that not being a horticulture professional, that there's a difference between shrubs and trees, and shrubs are often what is overgrown in, in our lots and, and backyards and so on. So I wondered from a legal or a practical, you know, just for educating your inspectors as well, whether we should insert and sh volunteer trees and shrubs into that line, just to be clear. You're welcome to do so if you wish. Um, when you read that and you interpret it, we can tear it apart in multiple ways of what abouts. Sure. So I don't have an answer for you. Um, I see what you're talking about. You know, we have to be clear because we say a, a garden, but we don't say anything about the plants that are ornamental. So a shrub, that boxwood, in this ordinance, it kind of says that we could cut those, which we can't. Or we wouldn't would be a better way. It doesn't exclude those like it does a cultivated garden. But everybody knows we're not going to go and clear cut someone's 13 inch box, boxwood. Well, it's a volunteer tree and shrub in this particular oh, line. It so. says volunteer trees. It doesn't say shrub. If you want to add volunteer shrub, I, yeah. I, I got you. Um, I mean, what we're trying to do is, is, is always, I think, write something that is legally, technically right, but also that the average person can read it to see whether they're in compliance or not and, and sees their name on right. there, and, if you and, will. In my mind's eye, I see brush as that, but I... I I'm not a horticulturist, so brush might be the furthest thing from a shrub. But that's usually what I look at when I'm seeing it overgrown, and it's brush. But you're well, yeah. if you want to be inclusive, what you could say is trees and other woody plants. That takes in everything that's got a woody stem, including trees, shrubs. You know what Mike is describing as describing as brush. Those are all woody plants. Yeah, sometimes the brush, what I see as brush is just the tall grasses that have gotten dry and kind of make a wall, you know, in which we sure. would include bamboo in, I don't know, and all that stuff. Uh, just, just was looking at it because we say woody vines and then trees. And again, I, I look at it from the idea that these codes are meant for the people who live here. And, you know, if they can read it and, and they get it, then hopefully we can simply prevent a lot of these things. That's the goal of our change, our culture. I wanted to suggest that one. And, and along those lines, the, um, in lines 18 and 19, where it says all premises and exterior property, including any easement or public right of way abutting the property, um, it seems like that's what your intent was. I mean, the, the IPMC, defines premises as those others, but I liked the switch that you made to actually describing that it was the easement or public right of way abutting the property so the average person would know what it meant. To that, be clear, premise and exterior are the deleted lines, so it's correct. now all property, yeah. Correct, yes. but I mean, one of the yes. things we went back and forth on in the past was the fact that the IPMC actually includes the street and the alley and the easement um, today that came up more often with junk cars than it did with vegetation. But I, I thought that that was a really good move on your part. Um, looking for hands. I've got one other that I'll, I'll raise. We had talked about what you do about undeveloped property and the fact that the city has what appears to be uncultivated vegetation around its own retention ponds and so on. And so how do we make sure that we somehow accommodate 
those properties where in the past we've decided to, quote, let it go, let's say. Um, and it looked to me like your, your section B, pages 33 to 35, was in a very brilliant way, very simple. But I did want to ask a couple questions notwithstanding. Have we checked? Do we know that where the city has its retention ponds, or others do as far as that goes, are those generally an acre or more in size so that this definition would, would accommodate them rather than us needing to add more exclusion language? That is probably a question to you for Mike. Do you know? No, I don't. Uh, I'll you, have to follow up on that. I'm not. Either TSG that. or maybe the water utilities would know those things based on just the mapping of the parcels. Because, you know, when we got into this, I was thinking, how do we do the exclusions? What, what do we do? And then this was so simple. So I was just trying to literally drive around town, you know, have it in mind driving around town as well as checking. Because this 30 feet in then, generally the property, there's either like two feet, sometimes no feet, <laughs> from the sidewalk all the way up to where the, the generally going to be somewhere, the easement's probably going to be only about 10 feet, 10 to 20 feet. So that means that a property owner would need to mow in a ways in order to meet this standard otherwise. So we have room to move that 30 feet. That's a number I selected. Okay. Um, it could have been 10. It could have been 20. I placed 30 just for when we go out and we meet these people who own these properties. Mm -hmm. They've got five acres right in the middle of the city, and it's not yep. agricultural. And one of the concerns that I have is if I tell them to mow it all and they say no, we're mowing it all. And if we <laughs> mow it all, I don't have the equipment or the staffing for the properties throughout this city when you take a look at all of them that are around here. The 30 feet covers both us and the ownership mm -hmm. of that. And then I try to envision living in the house next door to that property. Mm -hmm. How far away would I want that stuff cut back? And 30 feet seemed reasonable. Um, 10 feet, I would have felt crowded by the overgrowth if I was living next door. Um, so that's why that number was selected. Well, what that does is very, I've taken some complaints, which I think you know, because I probably asked you about them, but where people have allowed the utility easement, they don't have alleys, but they've got a utility easement down the middle of the block, and some people have put fences, and a lot of people have let them get overgrown. And so this very neatly, in one line, takes care of saying those utility easements have got to be clear, which... As, as one example, I thought was really good. I just wondered about the where a parcel isn't quite an acre, actually, and I, I, I didn't know how much checking you guys had done to know how many properties would maybe run afoul of this. No, I, I haven't done any checking on that. Okay. I'm just familiar with all the things that I've done over the years mm -hmm. and the people that contact me. Mm -hmm. And I, I can, in my, my head, I can start rattling off the properties that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but I, acre was selected because you three quarters of an acre. What are we going to, what number are we going to use? And it was selected as an acre because I was envisioning 10th and Yerish, which is multiple acres. Mm -hmm. um, the lots behind Fairlawn Plaza, multiple acres. Um, second, I think Alkire, probably six acres. Mm -hmm. So most of these are bigger than one acre. Um, what I didn't address is if you go to Lawrence Bay, there is 40 lots that one property owner owns. Mm -hmm. Do we consider that one? It's not one parcel. Do we consider right. it one issue? And if we have to mow those lots, which that owner's been very clear with me that we can have the lots if we want them, he's not going to do anything with them, then I'm mowing them. Or I can negotiate with them and say, look, just cut it off the street, make a big 30 foot, and that's what they did. Uh huh. Well, so. those are the examples that we need, I think, because if possible, what we want to do is vote in something that um, we've, we've challenged with the what ifs and, sure. and so on, and we, we know what we're going to do about it. And, and part of the thought of having this discussion today in, in a public meeting was to kind of get the word out there, and, and if people wanted to react, they could as well. Just kind of see how we're doing. Um, 
Well, it would be worth it, I think, to check what our own. We sent an email to utilities to ask and follow up on that, so. Okay. Um, yeah, that was, those were the two parts of that one that I had. Um, could you, one of you or someone, talk a little bit more about what the interface is between this and forestry, what their ordinance is now and the tasks that they have? Yeah, I'm just going to do a real high level and then turn it over to uh, Mike and Travis. In the forestry code, the city forester has certain powers currently under the code, and I think Mike can talk about how it currently interacts with property maintenance and who's doing what and if there's duplication of responsibilities, which is a policy question uh, for you as the city council. But currently the forestry division does have the authority to spray and treat and remove trees, hedges, shrubs, etc., from public property, um, alleys and streets that are in the way. They have the ability to order a property owner to clear the alley and the abutting property. Um, there is a process <coughs> similar to the code process um, for duties of the private property owner. The forestry agent can file a complaint. They have a right of appeals. Um, a lot of that is very similar to the property code maintenance, but it's done through the Office of the Forestry. And in practice, I'm not sure how often that is ever used. So I'll turn it over to Mike. Um, when forestry gets involved, it's growing into the street, sidewalk, or alley, like it says. Um, even with our new code, so we brought in forestry because of how the, the code is read. It's not going to change it much. Most of these properties that they're dealing with, that's not true, what I was about to say. So there's a lot of urban forest in the city, and those are going to continually be forestry's problem because it's already established growth. Um, and it's also vacant properties that nobody owns that they got to cut back. So I don't think there's a dramatic change with forestry. They're going to continue doing that. What might help is when we're able to get it at the front end and cite it for the overgrowth and get it cleared out so that forestry never has to become involved. So I don't know if there has to be any changes. Legal might feel differently and they see, see why. But when we can get on top of all this, it'll lessen the burden upon forestry. At a minimum, I think it would be helpful if we carried over the definition of vegetation from our new vegetation weed ordinance to the forestry for consistency. Um, if you were going to do nothing else, I think that would be extremely important. Um, the forestry agent, like uh, Mike says, does have the authority to determine if these are a has like trees are a hazard to travel. So if they're completely blocking an alley or a road, he has that kind of authority. Uh, to order those kind of removals. Well, and our goal here is mutually to have the property owners understand that it, what the rules are, and when we took overgrown vegetation out of, or stopped enforcing it through property maintenance, then nobody had any responsibility and forestry just went in and either just trimmed or noticed and trimmed and so that makes sense and forestry does have one other important power that property rate maintenance does not have um, they do have the authority when a tree is infested with disease or insect pest or larva uh, that could be detrimental to all the rest of the trees in the city to order those removals okay. um, versus property maintenance is dealing with overgrowth and growth so if you had some brand new invasive type of larva that's going to take out all the trees in Topeka, the forestry officer does have the authority to order that kind of removal. We need to make sure we have notes about that in our implementation plan because typically a lot of us on council get calls from people who want a tree removed, that it's dangerous or whatever, and the stock answer is um, <laughs> that forestry only address, is not only responsible for, but will only address trees that are in the right of way. So there is a difference if they are inf infested. Yeah, 12.65.090, um, order to treat or remove um, in your packet, talks about whenever the city forester determines that trees, trees material, or shrubs located upon private property are a hazard to convenient travel on public streets, alleys, or sidewalks, or are infected or infested with disease or insect, pest, or larva, 
and may constitute a hazard or result in the damage or destruction of other trees on public or private property, they shall give written notice to abate. So that is not just in streets, that's on private property as well as in the public right of way. Boy, it's yeah, this, this is Travis. Hi, Travis. Um, so basically that's gonna cover your Dutch elm disease. That's probably when that was put on the books. Um, and right now that would be mostly for emerald ash borer. So that is specific to ash trees. Um, and then you could throw maybe pine wilt in, but pine wilt for the most part's worked its way through our area. So there's not a lot of that. Um, so yes, we do have the ability to go in and say, your tree is harboring a disease that if left uncontrolled can spread to the rest of our urban population. And then we can have them remove it, um, which we really haven't done a lot of. Um, but yeah, that's why that's on the books. Um, and then as far as kind of brush and alleys, um, all we're required to do, even if we site the property, which historically we do not do, um, is just to, to clear the street or alley or sidewalk. So if you've got a bush on private property that's grown over, you know, two feet of the sidewalk, all I can tell them to do is to clear the sidewalk or street. So they can basically cut it to curb line and we're good under how it's written. Um, so that we can't go, <clears throat> based on what I have, we can't go any farther than that. Now I could, if it's still on city right of way, we technically could say, hey, we're gonna clear this out. Um, but in the cases of alleys, those are extremely small right of ways anyway. Um, so you're basically just cutting it back enough to allow travel down that alley or road or whatever. So what I'm hearing is that there, you know, we probably want to fully sync up definitions and, and, <clears throat> and powers, if you will, but that, um, really it, most of it is going to be a matter of syncing up the f functions so that you all are, are working in tandem and, and you have in the past, but with this, with upgrading the vegetation rules, just to, um, to, to be more efficient and so on. My understanding too is that already, um, if they do write tickets, they don't really have a collection system like property maintenance does. And so you've been able to partner a little bit on that too before? We haven't partnered well, with billing, no. Yeah, Mike's correct. I mean, we never really have. Um, just because historically, way before my time, I mean, I've been here 19 years, but before that, I mean, you didn't cite for this sort of thing. Um, and I think primarily the reason behind that is we weren't set up for that. We don't have the capabilities right now to do that. Um, so I think it fell under Mike or code. Um, and I, I guess I wouldn't have a problem maybe syncing it up, but I think having it the way it is now, all of that would be covered under code. So code could cite it, um, that would cover us. I don't, what do you think, Mike? Well, for the stuff that you enforce, no, because that's what's growing out into the street. I, with how the code's written, I'm gonna have to evaluate that. Because, I, I mean, I already have trepidation on this because if these bushes reach feet in height, five feet in height, and we got it all over the city, I have not been budgeted, equipped, or set up with the manpower to actually address large bushes. I don't have any of the equipment. I got a chainsaw, and everything else is designed to mow grass. So when we start to address these, and we've our, our budget's already laid out for 22 and 23, I don't have staffing or budget to even dispose of the bushes that we would collect if we went full force. Well, and understand that's why we're here. Correct. Because the idea was that we needed to take it progressively, but 
determinedly so that people understood they needed to do it and that we're not failing to enforce something because we don't want to have to mow it ourselves as a city. And so it, it's, it's figuring out that step by step to change our culture and, uh, and not, not have it, not, not have to have you write it up at all, ultimately, as we have in the goals. And so did you have something, Amanda? I, I did. I just did want to point out with the change that you're considering under vegetation, property including any easement or public right of way abutting the property, that would give authority for code to site Absolutely. in the street moving forward, which all they of currently it. don't have. Right, all of it. And actually, when Travis goes back 19 years, I go back that far too. And it was very clearly included in our code before and enforced in the code before. And so what's happened is that has dropped off over time. It's not like this consideration is new at all. And so we just have to get back. And um, could be, Travis, that you could be the most popular people in town if you'll take out infested trees. And, and one of the things that on a different subject that we work on, which is sidewalks, that people don't understand broadly that you all will help come trim roots too, so people can relay their bricks or their concrete sidewalks. And so we just need to do a lot of PR for you. That's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> I know. Anyway, lots of opportunities for, for good stuff in this community, really. We're just trying to figure out how to take it a step at a time. Um, hmm. any, those were the two things that I wanted to bring up. To, uh, utilities did get back to us and they said that yes, all the city uh, land with retaining ponds are more than one acre um, because that's required by KDHE, so yes. Perfect, all right. So it would still mean that, that utilities who may not be doing it would have to, let's see, get in 30 feet from the property line, but they're, I, I don't know, the ones I've been at seems that they're mowing the perimeters. I'm, I'm not positive. Do you know? They're generally well groomed. I know, yeah. but then you get down closer and the, the vegetation's just growing up because that's part of the, the whole the riparian scientific buffer, system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Committee members, are there others that have uh, questions or comments that you want to put forth? Well, that's pretty good. Um, let's see. Okay. With that, um, we will move on to just do some brief highlight comments on what's happening with some of the other aspects of the Change Our Culture of Property Maintenance Initiative. I'll hand off to Hannah Yorig, who has been staffing this committee. Thank you so much. Of course. So again, real brief, um, currently we are working on finalizing an RFP that will be put out within the next week or two regarding a mowing program we would like to help pilot in the community for this coming year and see how it can take off. Um, essentially, the uh, premise of it is to solicit proposals from different organizations on how they would approach such a program that would help support our LMI neighborhoods in getting ahead of code enforcement. So instead of being reactive and abating the properties, um, this would provide them another option to instead contract um, for the mowing services prior to being cited. This will also be promoted as part of a larger scale um, push to ignite the Change Our Culture Property Maintenance Initiative through different platforms such as social media as well as a new website that we will be launching congruently. Um, the website is currently under development. We're looking to it as a place for community um, partners or citizens to use as a landing place that will include some of the history from the public sessions that have happened thus far as well as what are the goals of the initiative and how to get involved. So what different activities do we have going on, um, volunteer opportunities, as well as information for programs such as the mowing initiative. Um, this will also be where we start to publish some of the key findings from the May 8 engagement. Um, 
of which our current updates, Karen Black, the consultant we have hired, um, will be coming to Topeka in person to do various activities such as um, roundtables with different internal and external groups and different stakeholder engagements, um, some more formal than others. And she'll be here from Sunday, May 22nd through um, Thursday, May 26th. So we'll look to get different meeting invites and different pushes for the activities that we're planning during that um, three-day visit. And more information will be posted on the site as part of the launch. Anything else, Karen, or Councilwoman Hiller, that you would like me to add to that one before we turn it over to Monique? Um, I don't think so. Let's turn it over to Monique and let her plug in a little bit. Thank Monique you, Madam. Monique Day mm -hmm. from Community Engagement. Thank you, Madam Chair. So after speaking with the um, committee, you had inquired in regards to potentially utilizing volunteers for the program. And so um, my recommendation is that we utilize the United Way to Begin Volunteers platform. It is an existing platform that's user friendly, has a project management aspect and component to it, and it also manages volunteer hours. And so what that would look like is that the city of Topeka, changing the culture of property maintenance would be the agency each individual project would be called an opportunity, which would provide the title of their project, the description of the project, the responsibilities that would be included for the volunteer time frame, and then also additional details, such as age range of the volunteer, and is it a f family friendly um, project as well. Community engagement would be the um, entity that would insert all of the projects into the the um, actual platform, and then the volunteer would be able to either go on the Change in the Culture of Community um, of Property Maintenance website that will be automatically linked to our page as an agency and search for various opportunities. It would therefore then be their responsibility to select that opportunity. If that's one that they'd like to utilize, they would be able to contact that neighbor and get the specifics of the dates and the times that they would be there and, and to go from there. And then community engagement will be able to, as well as Hannah and yourselves, will be able to go in to take a look at to see the progression of each of the projects and if there's any um, questions or concerns or any comments are given there. Um, a couple of factors to keep into to, um, context is definitely wanted to speak with Amanda in regards to a hold harmless um, document and agreement that would alleviate the city from being liable and also a push with the uh, city for to identify some volunteer groups churches organizations um, other religious entities and businesses to be able to really kick off and ask them to be a part of this and then working with city for to create a very aggressive marketing plan that would take place um, from here until the end of the season actually the end of the year to be able to create some interest for next year as well so working really closely with Director um, Barklow, and I will provide that information to Hannah as well, um, at United Way to talk about if there are any project limitations. That's the only thing I'm concerned about, project slash what they call opportunity limitations per agency. So we'll get that information from her and also asking her some other information about success rates. And I'll be able to share that information with you as well. So that's my recap. Thank you. Thank you. You're Questions welcome. for Hannah Ulrig or Monique Laude or for the group? It is already, um, maybe everybody else in the room has done their first mow already, but we know the grass is already growing and the vegetation is already getting started. Um, in general, the, and, and Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala and I have been working to lead with, with Hannah and others on this, that this first summer we're hoping that things will be, <clears throat> we're just going to build it as we can as we get into this season. That website is still underway. Um, the, the, conceptual d design for the major public education campaign is in. We do um, have a commitment that we want to not only capture volunteer opportunities or needs through, these, um, through, through this combination of websites, but also are looking to design into at least hours where people have made their own commitments with a neighbor or on a block with a group that they don't need us to match them up, but here's what we're going to do so that we can be counted and celebrate the, the kinds of things that they've done. So we'll just need to stay tuned on that. Should have some <laughs> updates and hopefully some the beginning of that campaign before this committee meets even again the next time. Um, OK, anything else on the related Change Our Culture initiatives? Um, we'll get to this again and, and repeat it in a minute, but this committee meeting is scheduled for 
May 23rd at 1 p.m. in this location next month, and that will be during what Hannah described as the visit from Karen Black, who is doing the policy and procedures consultation with us. And so that will take up this next meeting, and we'll update and, and then go from there. All right. This committee has been involved in some other issues, so I wanted us to just touch on those before we wrap up today. Um, did anybody get a report from Neil Dobler about broadband? If not, I, I will simply report that uh, because broadband was a major issue that this uh, committee got going last year and is, is committed to keeping an eye on this year in I hope I'm qu quoting him correctly. Things are moving. The subcommittee that's been working on broadband has continued to work. And things have been happening in terms of funding sources and so on as well. So we should have a brief update on that next time. Um, but it is, it is not on an agenda at this point. Um, Christina, Councilwoman Valdiviacola, would you like to do a brief on the homeless situation, which this committee is also been keeping an eye on. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just want to say that there are a number of possible uh, movements and initiatives that are going on, uh, discussions right now with the chronic unsheltered uh, population wanting to be cognizant of the needs that are there along with the needs of the uh, residents in the neighborhoods where we are starting to see it increased camping, squatting, encampments along the river, et cetera. I brought to the attention uh, initially to the council, city manager, et cetera, an initiative that has uh, been very successful in a number of cities our size, and that is the Built for Zero um, Chronic Unsheltered Program, which is highly successful. The city manager does have uh, someone, a couple of people looking into that right now, along with some other initiatives that uh, he, I'm sure, will want to give us an update on uh, at our next, not the May meeting, uh, but the June meeting, so we can uh, let the public know where we are at this time and what I believe is a crisis. And so my hope is that in the June meeting, we will be able to devote the amount of time that's needed to address this. Thank you so much. Any questions from anybody on that? Okay, the last thing I stubbed in on here was the issue of bees, people, people keeping bees in their yards has come to the council. Um, we have, have not taken it on our agenda for this committee yet, but my understanding from Liz, who's staffing the issue right now, uh, Liz Toyne, who's the council staff person who's sitting in the back here, is that right now that's being examined by staff. Is that right? Staff meaning legal? Uh, well, legal department has been working with planning and zoning to figure out the most appropriate mechanism for regulation of bees. I think ultimately we've decided zoning doesn't work, so we're drafting an ordinance that would put it back in the code in a different provision. So once that's ready, we'll bring it back to you um, if we figure out zoning doesn't work. So we're still in process and looking at it from a staff perspective. Well, I would, I would throw out that because because of the popularity of native plant gardening and pollinator um, flyways and networks and so on, uh, having bees, as, as we know, is more popular. And so they have to be addressed sort of like chickens in terms of whether they're popular, but as long as they're managed, <laughs> it's OK. I, I think what we're looking at now is similar to like dangerous dogs, where bees are fine unless they're attacking your neighbor kind of thing. So we're trying to figure out a happy medium. <laughs> uh, okay, Councilwoman Valdiviacola. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you tell me, uh, City Attorney, is this something where we're just looking at uh, an in a small increase, what you're looking into, is it like a small increase of bees in yards based on pollinator plants, or will this also be addressing, uh, let's use, for example, I think that in the future you may start seeing in community gardens in neighborhoods, you may see the movement towards gardens having uh, beehives, maybe like bee, bee colonies, right? To help increase the amount of, of 
bees pollinating since you know we know we're losing our bees but also for the nutritional component of the honey and i know that there is talk in in some community gardens so i didn't know if that was going to be part of it too in, in in residential neighborhoods it's still a very much work in progress but actually the initial constituent concern came from urban bee farmers who have numerous hives and uh, almost commercial activity in their backyard where they have multiple hives and they're growing lots of honey. So not necessarily the random bees or the cultivated gardens or the random hives, more that in big business yes. kind of, <laughs> or home, home business, huh? Yes. All right. Yeah. All because I, okay. Got it. I know a number of people that are now keeping hives and it's different and good, good stuff. All right, well, those were the three uh, related issues that I, I thought we should just uh, touch on. The only other thing I have on the agenda is to set some future meeting dates out so that we are set. T today we are on a, we're on a fourth Monday, I think. We are scheduled for what is the, is it the fourth, I think it's the fourth Monday, the, the 20, is that the third? Third Monday or fourth Monday of May? It looks like this one to three on a Monday time is good for us. And so if possible, at least with three of us here, if, um, if we, we could tentatively agree on um, either the a third or fourth Monday of the month, once you get later in the year, you start running into holidays with a fourth Monday. I think a third Monday as a rule is probably a better, better date if this day of the week and this time of the, the day works as a rule. Sure, I'm good with that. The third Monday this time is fine for me. Councilman Duncan. Got to unmute. Yes, that works for me. <laughs> okay, well, we'll check with, with um, Councilman Dobler as well, but let's tentatively pencil at least through August, maybe just through the rest of the year. Does that work for you? Okay. Um, these dates and that way we'll, we won't have to talk about it every time. Okay, any other business from the committee or those who are on the call? If not, Thank you all. There's a lot of work going on on all these issues in between these meetings. And so thanks to everyone who's leading or partnering or helping to make this happen. Um, and with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>